And so uh, welcome everyone uh, to uh, the launch of the Lowy Institute Southeast Asia Aid Map. Uh, before we begin, uh, let me start by acknowledging uh, the traditional owners of the land in which we are meeting here uh, today and uh, pay my respects uh, to their elders past, present and emerging. Let me also uh, mention that we have uh, several board members of the Lowy Institute here. Uh, let me thank uh, Sir Angus Houston and the Honourable uh, Penny Wensley for joining us here today. Uh, let me also acknowledge uh, our research director is also here, Hervé Lemahieu, enjoying uh, the snacks. <laughs> uh, my name is uh, Roland Raja and I'm uh, the lead economist at the Lowy Institute, but I'm also uh, very glad to say that I'm uh, now also the uh, director of our newly established uh, Indo-Pacific uh, Development Centre, which is part of how Lowy is really looking to deepen and expand our work uh, on development issues uh, in the region. And our work uh, on development finance uh, in the Indo-Pacific, in Southeast Asia, and in the Pacific in particular, is a key element uh, of that, uh, of our work. And uh, that's very much led by my colleague, Alex Dayant, who is the lead researcher uh, behind the Southeast Asia aid map, and you will be uh, hearing from him in a, in a moment about uh, the map as well as our other colleague, uh, Grace Stanhope, who's also uh, here today and another core part of the team uh, behind the map. Uh, now, many of you will be familiar with the Lowy Institute's uh, uh, Pacific Aid Map. And now as we look to build on that work and move to, the South, to South, Southeast Asia, obviously the challenges become much bigger. It's a much bigger region. There's a lot more players uh, operating in the region, many more projects, a lot more dollars, and a lot more use of a wider set of development finance instruments that go uh, well beyond aid towards, in particular, uh, non-concessional lending, uh, guarantees, and equity investments, and a, a range of other instruments. There's also a much bigger role played by a range of non-traditional uh, development partners. So not just the traditional development partners such as Australia, the United States, Japan, or multilaterals like the World Bank or the Asian Development Bank, uh, but also a range of emerging non-traditional partners such as China, uh, India, and the Middle East. Uh, so the picture is very, very complex. And fortunately uh, for us, that's where the uh, Southeast Asia aid map uh, comes in to shed light on the very many important questions going on in the region around how development finance can support uh, the region's ongoing development, how it can help respond to the challenges uh, posed by climate change, but also how it's playing a role within uh, the geostrategic competition going on principally between uh, China and uh, various other countries operating in the region. Uh, so the proceedings for tonight, in a moment we are going to hear from uh, Alex Dayant as the lead researcher behind the map who's gonna present on the interactive tool that has been created as well as the key findings uh, from this uh, initial launch of the map. And then we're gonna move into a panel discussion with some of our experts and then Q&A uh, with the audience. Uh, but before we uh, get to that, as uh, this project has been very uh, generously uh, supported by the government uh, through DFAT, uh, we also have an important message um, from the Minister for International Development and the Pacific, uh, Minister Pat Conroy, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, but um, he's relayed a message for us uh, via video. Hi, I'm Pat Conroy, Australia's Minister for International Development and the Pacific. Since 2018, the Lowy Institute's Pacific Aid Map has recorded who is supporting development in the Pacific and how much they are giving. In a system like ours, we are accountable to the Australian public and need to be able to demonstrate to Australians that their money is being spent effectively and responsibly abroad. But we are also accountable to the governments and communities around the region that we partner with. They also deserve clarity in who is supporting development initiatives in their countries and how much they are providing. Aid transparency must be at the heart of a healthy and modern international development program. Greater transparency allows donor governments to coordinate better, to avoid duplication and waste, and to maximise the benefit delivered to the partner government and community. So, when it comes to delivering aid that matters, transparency is a rising tide that lifts all boats. 
Today, we come together to mark the launch of the Lowy Institute's Southeast Asia Aid Map. The map will reveal the currents of international development in Southeast Asia and allow anyone using it to compare the contributions of approximately 70 donors in the region. In support of this excellent initiative, the Australian Government has provided $1.8 million in funding over three years to deliver this mapping across Southeast Asia. Providing development assistance is the right thing to do. It's in our national interest and it's in our region's interests. It's part of our foreign policy mission to secure the peace and prosperity of the Indo-Pacific. That's why the Albanese government has increased Australia's official development assistance by $1.59 billion over the five years from 2022-23 to 2026-27, which includes an additional $470 million to Southeast Asia. This is the biggest increase in the aid budget since 2011-12. The government has also restored long-term growth to the aid budget by reinstating indexation from 2026-27. These decisions will see Australia's annual ODA budget return to $5 billion a year from 2026-27 after falling to $4 billion per year under the former coalition government. The government has also been busy constructing Australia's new development policy, the first long-term development framework in almost 10 years. At the centre of this policy is our commitment to partnerships in our region. This means genuinely listening to our partners so we can lift the quality of our development program. Australia's development assistance partnerships with Southeast Asia are a priority for this government. Our Southeast Asia program works with partners to tackle shared challenges including climate change and the clean energy transition, gender equality, inclusive economic growth resilience, rapid digitisation, knowledge and skills development and infrastructure. Our commitments to the region help our partners become more economically resilient, develop critical infrastructure and provide their own security so they have less need to call on others. Southeast Asia is one of the most vibrant and dynamic regions in the world and the success of countries within the region matters to Australia. Our international development program supports growth, stability and promotes state agency. But intentions, while important, aren't everything we must get the delivery right. We are committed to listening to our partners and helping to meet their ambitions and priorities. We are committed to transparency and the Low Institute Southeast Asia map will allow us to uphold this commitment and to genuinely work with our partners to provide the support they need. I have every confidence the Southeast Asia aid map will be a fantastic extension to the work already done by many in this field. Congratulations to the Low Institute on the launch of this important initiative. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you uh, to the Minister and also uh, to DFAT for supporting uh, this project. Uh, now, without uh, further delay, I'd like to invite uh, my colleague, Alex Dyant, up to the stage. Uh, Alex is the Deputy Director of the Indo-Pacific Development Centre at the Lowy Institute and also a senior economist in the IPDC. He is uh, the man behind the Pacific Aid Map as the lead researcher of that product, and now he is also the lead researcher behind the Southeast Asia Aid Map. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming Alex to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, good evening. Uh, good evening, everyone. So uh, my name is Alex Dayant. I am the map guy at the Lowy Institute. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so look, I'm, I, I led this research project, and um, and so really today it marks the culmination of two years of, of hard work, where my team and I, so Grace, Roland, and many others, have really like you know spent a lot of time trying to analyze and really um, measure uh, development flows in Southeast Asia, uh, and so you know I must admit I'm very happy this project is over because I'll be able to have a social life now again. <laughs> Uh, I'll be able to have normal nights, uh, but mostly I'm very happy to see uh, that many of you here tonight. Uh, you know, uh, it's it's really like I mean this is a great turnout, and uh, we had a lot of attention today in the media on on this specific project. So, yeah, thank you very much to all of you for being here tonight. Here tonight, it's uh, it's um, you know, it's a great compliment for us. So. Um, look, what I'm going to do is I'm going to organize my presentation in three parts. The first part, I'm going to explain you how we build the aid map. The second one, I'm going to show you how it works. And the third part is uh, I'm going to show you, to talk to you about some key findings. So, well, how do we do um, the, the Southeast Asia aid map? 
Um, we have collected data on more than 100,000 projects uh, from 97 de different development partners, not 70 like the minister was saying, 97, um, from 2015 to today. And so for traditional partners like Australia, uh, New Zealand, France, or even the World Bank, we, um, we had two primary sources of information. One is the uh, OECD, um, where all development partners are required to actually report their development program. Another platform is, is called the IATI, the International Aid and Transparency Initiative, where you can find way more detailed project information. Um, but we also engage with the development partners directly. So, you know, we got in touch with the, the bank, with, with the French government and so forth. But for the non-traditional uh, non development partners, you can imagine it was a whole different story. I mean, China doesn't have a repository of all its AIDS projects in Southeast Asia. Uh, India uh, doesn't have the same either. Uh, Taiwan, uh, Taiwan doesn't have either. And so we had to adopt a more, uh, more hands-on approach, uh, where we had to go through every um, Southeast Asian budget document. Uh, we had to go through every press release, social media post, just to be sure that we found enough information for each project to not only see that this project was happening on the ground, but triangulate this information just to make sure that those projects were a real thing. And once we had gathered all this information, we, we sent it directly to, the, um, to each Southeast Asian countries, to the aid and development units, uh, manage, management units in, in Southeast Asia, for them to validate this information. Um, and once they had validated this information, then we put everything on a cool little interactive that I'm about to show you now. So this is the landing page of the Southeast Asia Inmap. It provides high-level information of official development finance uh, at the regional level. A key visual that you will see throughout this interactive um, is the presence of those two green circles. The outline circle represents the amount of development finance committed, that is, that is like the amount prom pr promised or signed for specific projects. And on the other hand, the field circle represents the amount of financing that has been actually delivered on the ground. And we figured out that was an important distinction to make because we realized that many development partners are committing a lot, but they are actually not implement implementing that much. Um, we have collected data covering the periods from 2015 to 2021, which represents the most recent years for which we have complete uh, information. And by default, uh, the landing page displays the aggregate figures for all the years exp expressed in constant US dollars. Um, on the left panel, you will find the ranking of, um, of development partners in the region. By selecting any of the 97 different uh, partners listed, you can uh, access their specific financing details in Southeast Asia. And after selecting a specific partner, you have the opportunity to explore the distribution of their development finance across various sectors. Um, we have also implemented a filter selection where you can get more specific results on the data. In this, in this section, we have also created pre-selected filters, uh, for instance, looking specifically at climate development finance or looking at the footprints of non-traditional non -traditional development partners in the region. Um, so Every time you select a Southeast Asian country, you can either have a look at uh, the detailed analysis we have made on this country, or you can jump directly on the project map page, uh, where you will see individual projects starting to populate the map. When clicking, uh, when clicking on a project, um, additional information will be displayed. This includes uh, the project description, the, se the sector it belongs to, relevant internet links, and the transaction history of this project. And from the, project, from the project map, sorry, you can also narrow down your search by selecting a specific development partner or sector, and the map will automatically update with the relevant information. But, you know, while we, we think this is a cool feature of the, the aid map, we have also to acknowledge the fact that, um, you know, you cannot put all type of projects on a map. You can put scholarship or budget support. And so for this, we had to actually um, broaden the scope of our ambition for the map, and we had to create a new um, analytical tool for you to be able to cut the data in the way that, um, that uh, you find interesting. And so um, the first of this tool is uh, the database page. It serves as a repository for the extensive collection of over 100,000 projects that we have compiled. And so when you click on a project, detailed information specific to that project will uh, be displayed. We have also implemented a filter box to help you, uh, for, um, to help you look for a specific project. 
Um, and most importantly, you can you know, freely download our entire data set um, and create your own analysis by you know, creating, uh, cl uh, clicking sorry, on the top left button that says download uh, the data. Um, another feature of the SAS East Asia map is a graphing tool that allows you to create trend analysis. Um, here you can select from a range of different variables that will allow you to generate the graphs that you are interested in. Um, for instance, you can compare uh, the amount of grants or loan provided to SAS East Asia, um, or the amount of development finance disbursed in the infrastructure sector versus uh, the amount of uh, money disbursed in human development. You can also, you know, add different filters. You can, uh, but you can also change the type of graph that you that you are interested in. Um, and so, we also have implemented a tool that enables you that enables you to do a direct comparison between different partners. Uh, for instance, user can easily compare Australia's development finance in Southeast Asia to that of China. And once selected, this section provides a wealth of information on about, about the, these two partners, including their allocation on development finance, the sectors they prioritize for financing, uh, and their major projects in the region. And so obviously you can do the same with each Southeast Asian countries as well. Yes, I like that someone likes this, uh, this picture. Could you do, yes. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, from our menu section, um, you can access all the information on the website Notably, the many uh, country analysis that uh, I've mentioned before, but also um, a series of thematic analysis on climate, on uh, infrastructure, and so forth. Um, and more importantly, you can access our, um, our methodology. You can download our, the whole data set again. And one of the things you can do also uh, is actually um, you know, have our key finding reports, but you should all have one, uh, be seated on one of them. So this is it for like the interactive. Now let me talk to you about our key findings. Did you like it though? Nice? Yes, I like this. A round of applause, please. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, key findings. Um, yeah, so the first key findings is that, you know, between 2015 to 2021, Southeast Asia received about $200 billion in official development finance. So just as a reminder, for us, official development finance is uh, the combination of grants, concessional loans, so loans that are below market rates, and non-concessional loans. So those loans are a bit more expensive to the, to the concessional loans, but they still have the purpose for development. So Southeast Asia receives around $28 billion per year in official development finance, mostly targeted at the most pressing development needs of, of uh, the region, such as health, education, social protection, but also infrastructure. Almost half of it is concessional by nature, uh, so meaning it, uh, it is under the form of grants or uh, cheap loans, and the other half is actually non-concessional loans that are mostly provided by China's main policy bank, so the Exim Bank of China or the Chinese Development Bank, but also by the, um, the World Bank and the, uh, the Asian Development Bank. In terms of trends, development financing has been decreasing over the years, um, mostly reflecting a diminution of, uh, in ODA, uh, you know, official development finance disbursed in both Indonesia and Vietnam, that together account for almost half of all the development finance going to Southeast Asia. And as you can see, there is a peak in 2020, so like the COVID-19 in 2020 and the reactivity of development partners means or led to like a 55% increase in, in funding where official development finance reached, reached a peak of $35 billion. So where is this funding coming from? Well, as you can see, China is the largest uh, development partner in the region, but not by far. Um, it is followed by the multilateral development banks, so the ADB and the World Bank, uh, that focus actually less, uh, less of their uh, development finance on infrastructure. So infrastructure is the, the yellow bar that you can see on this graph. And, so, and Japan is the largest bilateral traditional uh, partner of the region. So where is this funding going? Well, most of it is directed towards the region most emerging and developing economies. Uh, so really we're excluding uh, Singapore and Brunei, although you could find project information for Singapore and Brunei in our, in our map. And Indonesia and Vietnam are receiving, you know, as I mentioned before, around half of the ODF delivered in the region. So the second key finding um, is that, you know, development finance plays a major role in meeting Southeast Asia development need. 
So Southeast Asia is one of the most you know, dynamic regions in, uh, in the world, and it has experienced decades of rapid economic growth, which have actually lifted millions of people out of poverty. And so today, one could argue that you know, the region is past the point of aid and development. I mean, especially when you look at the magnitude of you know, private, source of in private sources of, of, um, of investment, such as uh, sorry, private sources of financing, such as you know, um, um, private direct domestic uh, domestic private investment, foreign direct investment, and remittances. But the reality is that actually those type of uh, uh, financing don't always go to uh, specific areas such as health, you know, education, social protection, and even in infrastructure. Actually, um, most of the infrastructure is financed by the public sector. And so this is why aid and development remains actually um, um, a key component uh, in South East Asia in helping South East Asia in filling those gaps. And actually, we have estimated that um, ODF, so Official Development Finance, is equivalent to around 10 to 15 percent of total government develop of total government development spending on infrastructure, on health, on education, and on social protection. And this can actually jump to 80 percent when we consider the small countries, the smaller economies of uh, Southeast Asia, such as uh, Timor-Leste and, um, and Laos. Now, the third finding. The third finding is that China is the leading development partner in Southeast Asia, but it's actually declining and it faces competition. So China accounts for a fifth of um, development financing flowing to the region. This is massive, actually. I mean, this is around like $5.5 billion per year uh, to the region. And an important feature of Chinese development finance is that it's going, it is delivered through non-concession loan, mostly delivered by the two policy banks I mentioned before, so Exim Bank of China and China's development, Chinese, China's development Bank. And, um, and so a lot of this funding, this financing is going towards infrastructure. One of the interesting things that we've realized when we did this analysis is that actually Chinese financing is decreasing, as you can see, over the years. And so like, there are few reasons behind this decrease, we believe. The first of them is the first of them is that um, China's economy China's economy is actually experiencing a slowdown. So there might be a, there might be um, a reason for Beijing to actually prioritize uh, its funding to like its domestic market rather than spending money abroad. The second point uh, is that you know China is actually through this analysis we've realized that China is actually experiencing some complication when implementing its project on the ground. So for instance, I have two examples, like the, um, uh, the Jakarta to Bandung high-speed rail in Indonesia, or the East Coal Rail Link in Malaysia. Um, both of those projects have experienced actually difficulties and uh, many, many delays, some problems with land, rec land reclamation, sorry, in Indonesia. And this has been even more evident during uh, the global pandemic, where you know, international border closures and, um, and health restriction measures meant that basically the Chinese workers that were implementing those projects on the ground were not allowed in the country. And those projects have actually stalled for a little while. Um, and the third reason behind China's Chinese uh, financing decrease is um, it's actually a, a phenomenon that happens all around the world, but it also happened in Southeast Asia, is that China is providing a lot of financing, a lot of, a lot of financing through loans. And some of the countries struggle to actually pay back, the, pay back those loans. In, in Southeast Asia, for instance, Laos has already asked twice, the, twice China to push back the debt repayments uh, that Laos owned to, to China. And so we believe that maybe you know, China is actually becoming more cautious in the provision of its loans around the world. And so these basically, those three reasons have uh, contributed to like, a decrease in Chinese financing in, in Southeast Asia. And so we believe that now like, China is actually facing quite a competition, especially in the infrastructure sector. And so this is our next key finding is that infrastructure is where the real competition is uh, in Southeast Asia development financing. So in this analysis, um, as in the aid map, infrastructure is composed by four sectors, energy or power, telecommunication, uh, transport, and water and sanitation. And so infrastructure accounts for around 40% of the total development financing uh, spent in Southeast Asia, around $11 billion per year. And China is the leading, is the leading financier uh, with two-fifths of the infrastructure development financing delivered. But what we have realized is that actually China is far from being the dominant player um, in each of the sectors I mentioned before. So if you look at this graph, you see that in the energy sector, China accounts for half of it. And that might be the only place where actually China is leading the, the pack. In transport, actually, uh, Japan is, the, Japan is the, the, the partner that spends the most in Southeast Asia. In communication, China is actually on par with Korea. 
Uh, and in water and sanitation, China doesn't actually play a big role. And that maybe is like, uh, translate the fact that China focuses on economic infrastructure rather than social infrastructure. Um, but when you flip the coin, uh, I think this is something you can say in English, when you look at the other side, when you look at commitments, not disbursement, well, the story actually changes a little bit. China, uh, China's infrastructure commitment averaged around $12 billion per year uh, between 2015 and 2021, which is three times uh, the amount of Japan, the next largest uh, infrastructure partner, and more than half of the total commitment of the total commitment on infrastructure. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us two things. Like the first thing I believe is that you know China is, is facing uh, difficulties in implementing its project, and that has definitely reduced its infrastructure financing. But also the, the commitment shows us that China is still ambitious and still wants to remain the, you know, the, the main um, infrastructure provider in, in Southeast Asia. Now to my last key findings, and I'm doing very well with time. I'm kind of happy about this. Um, so climate development finance um, has increased steadily in Southeast Asia. So yeah, one of the things that we're doing in this, in this tool and that we will be actually doing in the Pacific Aid map, so keep an eye on this, is tracing climate development finance. So Southeast Asia is one of the most vulnerable region uh, to climate change. And so what we have seen is that over the years, climate development finance has actually uh, been increasing steadily over the years, um, mostly financed by the Asian Development Bank, by Japan, and by China. Um, and so in 2021, um, around $11 billion were spent in development finance uh, on climate, which represents around two-fifths of uh, the region mix of the region uh, development finance. But the, what we've realized also is that the outlook for climate, climate finance is mixed in, in, in Southeast Asia. And there are like three reasons behind this. The first one is that we realized that the increase in climate finance is mostly due to, in, to an increase in projects that have a significant component, component on climate mitigation and adaptation. Whereas like projects that have a uh, principal focus on climate adaptation and mitigation as, are actually flat. So that's like one of the first nuances to look, to, to look into. The second one is that with respect to the energy transition, we've seen that there is actually a decrease in non-renewable um, energy projects uh, in Southeast Asia. And so this is a good news. But we've also seen that actually there is a decrease in renewable energy projects. And so in a way, you know, like uh, this is coming from the fact that uh, actually energy projects overall across the board have decreased in Southeast Asia. So this, you know, uh, it's at odds with the region's need for more and cleaner energy. And the third point is that, you know, again, in this tool, we, we're tracing both disbursement and commitment. And so, yes, like the disbursement of climate projects have increased. But when we look at commitments, which actually gives us an indication of like the future disbursement, or like, you know, the, the outlook of disbursement on climate. Well, commitment on climate finance has actually been decreasing over the years. And so this tells us that, you know, there's a risk that um, we might see less and less climate development financing in the future. So this means that, yeah, the outlook for development finance, so for climate development finance is uncertain in, in the future. So anyway, those are my few other key findings. I hope you enjoyed this. Please do visit Southeast Asia, seamap.lowinstitute.org, I think it is. But uh, yeah, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please do ask them at the end of the presentation. And uh, please, my uh, fellow panelists, come on board. Okay, well, thank you for that, Alex. You know, it's a great, a huge wealth of information well and analysis is in there. So um, I encourage everyone to have a look at the, certainly at the interactive, it's very uh, user friendly. Um, uh, but also the key findings report is for those that would like the, uh, the key messages, the key takeaways given directly uh, to you, at least according to, to us. <laughs> um, before we, we begin, uh, let me uh, introduce our, our, uh, our panelists. Um, first, uh, next to Alex, we have uh, Dr. Hilman uh, Pallone. He is a digitalization uh, expert and research fellow in the Lowy Institute Indo-Pacific uh, Development Center and has formerly uh, worked, uh, one, with uh, the Indonesian uh, government's elite uh, poverty reduction uh, research unit attached to the uh, vice president's office, the TMP Duakar, as well as uh, GoTo, which is uh, Indonesia's leading uh, tech platform uh, company. Um, and then secondly, we have, of course, uh, Dr. Jenny Gordon. Uh, Jenny is a non-resident fellow uh, with the Lowy Institute 
She's uh, the former uh, chief economist at DFAT, also a former principal researcher at the Productivity Commission, and more generally just one of Australia's uh, top public policy economists. So Jenny, Hillman, and Alex, uh, thanks for sitting on the panel. Um, Hillman, I might um, kick off with a question uh, to you. Just, um, you know, we've seen the results from the map. We've seen the cool interactive that's been created. I mean, what's the sort of, what's the most interesting sort of elements that just, what's the parts that just jump out at you looking at what's what's on the on the screen? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Roland. I have an opportunity to test this uh, website before the launch, so last week. So I get the password from Alex. So I just tried to find out about that. What is the cool about this, uh, so this Asia 8 map? So number one is it's very user friendly. So congratulations for that. So even though you don't know about statistics, it's like easy to manage which information that you want to, you want to know from this Sodis Asia 8 map. So my interesting findings are, uh, number one is mostly the United States and Australia focus or supporting the hard skill things, uh, sorry, soft skill, like the government and civil society. Whereas the China and the Japan in this case, they are mostly focused on the hard skill things, which are the infrastructure and energy. So that's my first findings. And the second one, I see that I would like to, because my background is uh, more related to the banking and financial services, I would like to know who are the providers or the ODF uh, donors that support this area. And it's really amazed me that only World Bank and ADB mostly focus on the banking and financial services. So it's like a big question for me, where are the other donors? And then I try to uh, do the uh, analysis with other uh, findings from Indonesian uh, perspective. So I found out that uh, based on the data in late 2022 about the foreign workers in Indonesia, it's recorded around 100, 112,000 coming to Indonesia. And I'm not surprised because 50% of them are from China. And the second one is Japan. And then the, last one, the third one is from South Korea. So those are my, my findings and simple analysis from Alex, Southeast Asia, Aidmap. Thank you, Ron. Um, thank you. Thank you, uh, Hillman. Yeah, it's very striking, the um, soft infrastructure by the traditional donors, the hard infrastructure by, by, um, by China, essentially, by the non-traditional donors, and, as well as uh, Japan. Um, Jenny, what about you? What's the, what are the sort of key things that have jumped out at you? Well, it's a lot of fun to play with. <laughs> That's always a good start. And, and I really love the graphics. Uh, facility in it too. So I think one of the things that was really interesting to me was that, that you really make that committed versus spent very clear. And when you start looking and unpacking that, the really big one is China. You know, China's commitment, so I think I wrote the number down so I could remember it, 95 billion, but spent is 37.9. That's a big difference. And it's a couple of, when you start sort of unpacking and say, what is that? Um, does it really tell us much? It tells us there's a couple of really big projects that have yet to actually come to fruition for, for China. And there's some interesting questions about whether that's just COVID, uh, whether there are, what else is going on? And these are in the, you know, loans that are not at concessional rates and it's for Malaysia and Thailand. And so those are really interesting to see whether they're getting cold feet, is it just particular projects? So I think what I really love about this product is it, asks, it gets you to ask questions. You go, that's interesting, so what's going on there? So it's actually the drilling down, and then you can go and look at what are the projects that you, you're sort of seeing that haven't happened, that have been committed. So that was one really interesting area. And I think the other really, really interesting thing that it really leaps out at you, even though you kind of know it anyway, which is that Australia's aid portfolio, largely grant aid, we all know that, very tons of projects. I mean, you know, it's something like, almost 5,000 projects in the database, most of them really small. Mm. So if you're thinking about, you know, it's a really interesting um, development program that we have and it's very, very different to most of the other donors. I mean, more so some of the Europeans and the like, they're much similar in profile. But then you start thinking about what does it take to implement a program like that? You know, what sort of skill levels does it take and then that question of could we do something else in addition with development finance um, and then who we'd be competing with, who's already doing that well? Are they doing it well? Is anybody doing that well? would be the, uh, the other question. So I think it's, it's just a really fun thing to look at and to kind of go, that's interesting, go drill down. Mm. So that's what I recommend everybody do, have a play with it.
Mm. That's excellent. I remember when I saw and Alex told me the number of projects, it's 100,000 projects. Mm -hmm. The, the, the former aid practitioner in me was actively annoyed when I heard that number in terms of what that meant for aid effectiveness yeah. in the region. Um, but Alex, you know, Jenny brings up Australia. I mean, what for you, I mean, looking at this, at the map, Australia is one of the mid-sized players uh, in the region. But what do you think all of this means for what Australia yeah. is doing or needs to do? Yeah, Southeast that's Asia. a good, that, well, that's a good question. That's a good question, sorry. But just to uh, rebound on what you were saying before, you know, like uh, the numbers of aid projects uh, in the map. Yes, we have like 107,000 projects. Um, but, you know, you were, you were talking about like, oh, China commits a lot but doesn't actually do much. Well, China has way less projects than Australia. And so like the, uh, the average size of a Chinese project would be like maybe 10 times that of, uh, that of Australia, which in a way is not, you know, I mean, you could argue whether it's a good thing or bad thing, but, you know, um, it's actually, I think, a nuance to, to, to have. As to Australia, yes, so Australia is uh, in, in our aid map, Australia is what we call a, a mid-size uh, development partner. You know, we have a ranking of like uh, all the partners by, um, we're ranking them by volume of money disbursed in, in Southeast Asia, and so Australia ranks around eight. Uh, and if you take the multilateral development banks, the World Bank and the ADB, then it's ranked six. But still, you know, uh, it's far, uh, far behind other partners. Um, I think what's interesting with Australia is that, uh, you know, our, our aid program to, in Southeast Asia has actually been decreasing. Um, there's been decreasing until uh, the pandemic. And when the pandemic striked, uh, strike, stroke, happened, um, when the pandemic happened in uh, Southeast Asia, well, actually, Australia was one of the development partners that reacted the most forcefully. We tripled our development budgets to Southeast Asia, notably by providing a massive uh, loan uh, to Indonesia of 1.5 billion uh, Australian dollars. So I think this is a nuance to bring. Uh, another thing about Australia is that um, we are the third largest grant provider in, in Southeast Asia. You remember, like, there are three different types of financing in, in uh, in uh, the map, like the grants, the loans, and the, the concessional loans, and the non-concessional loans, while Australia is the third provider of grants in, in Southeast Asia behind uh, the United States, which is the first provider, and Japan. And so it still means that, you know, like we are actually a very generous country. We are a very generous partner in Southeast Asia. Now, like if you ask me, like, what else could we do? Well, you know, we could look at expanding our financing mechanism and provide maybe pro maybe provide more loans uh, similar to the loans that we've provided to uh, to Indonesia to other countries uh, and the government is currently going through like a development finance review and a, de uh, and a development review so maybe this is something that we could look forward to mm. and Jenny can I bring you in on this I mean um, a lot of the other development partners in the region not just China but also Japan the World Bank the ADB there yeah, they're achieving scale by using a variety, you know, a lot of non-grant financing, including completely non-concessional financing with, you know, maybe it's questionable with China at times, but the World Bank and ADB, Japan are also doing it. Do you think that's something Australia should be doing more of or, or what's your sort of view? Well, we've been having a wonderful debate. Um, if you want to read the interpreter, uh, you know, Roland's quite a fan of the development finance corporation idea. I'm always a bit more doubtful about it. But I think also you've got to think about it's, it's what, what are you designing an aid program for? What are you trying to do with it? It's just not the volume of dollars that matters. It's actually the content of what you're doing and how you're working with a partner. And we heard Minister Conroy talk about a really much stronger focus on partnerships. And those partnerships require actually quite a lot of diplomatic and bureaucratic and effort on the behalf of both partners to actually make them work. And so... Sometimes the, it's not so much the amount of money as that engagement. And that engagement won't necessarily show up in an ODA budget because of the way, you know, ODA is, is measured. So, but it is an effort that needs to be put in place. So if you want to be influential, it's not just the size of the bucks. And if you go build a bridge to nowhere, that's not very helpful. If you've displaced a bunch of people by building a, a big project, you can cause social disruption. And so I think I've gone off, have I? Mm -hmm. Oh, thanks. And so it's about being really careful about what you do as well. So it's not the total sum of money that matters quite so much in Asia as it does in the Pacific where there's a much greater need for finance. But, I mean, you know, we know the, the infrastructure deficit is enormous. We know there's a huge demand for infrastructure across the world, actually, investment for, you know, decarbonising 
the economy. So we know those numbers are big. But I just think we need to be thinking about the quality of our aid program and not just the spend and that we need to be thinking about that mix and how cleverly we can use that mix. That's very important. Uh, words of caution as per our, our online uh, debate. Just a quick note, we'll, I'm going to just throw to Hillman in a second, but after that we might start uh, taking questions um, from the audience, so please uh, be ready if you'd like to uh, ask a question. Um, but Hillman, um, what about from your perspective? I mean, you, you know, you've worked in the Indonesian government as a senior policy maker. You've also worked in the development sector in Indonesia. I mean, what do you think the region needs in terms of development finance? What role should it be playing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, most of the developing countries, especially Indonesia, so the North Star is they want to be a developed country. So to achieve this, they need to have like sustainable economic growth, reducing poverty, and also the inequality. So we come back in the basic uh, development economics, the, the growth, the poverty, and also the inequality. So Indonesia itself, uh, they would like to focus on the six priority sectors now, until at least until 2045. So the renewable energy, the health industry, the mining, but with added value. That's why we heard about the Indonesia request that smelters would be in the country. And then automotive come in the list, which is most part particularly for the electronic vehicle. And then after that, of course, the tourism. So those are uh, the, the main priority of Indonesia. But not to forget, uh, they would like to also create the job, uh, the job opportunities for having these kind of things. But the main challenge that I found out that everything we can buy, Indonesia can buy. They can allocate the money. Indonesia can get supporting from the investment projects. But the main challenge is to have the compatible human, develop, human, human capital in, in the country. So for instance, for the renewable energy, there are several support from donors for, the, for other uh, countries. But to operate it, in, to, to maintain it is another challenge. So a lot of solar panels just like, it works only for five years after that, nobody can maintain it. So the transfer knowledge is not there. So, so that's the main challenge mm. that I've yeah. foreseen. Thank, thank you. Um, maybe we'll go, go to the audience. Does anyone have a question for the panel? Yeah, just the front. Next There's a question. And anyone else, just put your hand up and I'll hopefully see you to line you up for the next one. Thank you very much for that. Uh, my name is Kim. Uh, I'm a, a business consultant. Um, I'd like to ask about um, the development um, of funding for religious uh, influence because I, I can see you've got infrastructure and education and health and those sorts of really great things. But the particular area that you're looking at, that particular Asian region uh, within the CMAP, has, have you embedded in there? Uh, studies about the religious influences in particular, like the Islamic influences. Thank you. Thank you. Alex, do you want to take yeah. that question? Uh, Kim, thank you very much. And thank you for liking, for your reaction when we showed the, the comparative to that was really good. Um, uh, yes, so sorry, yeah, about like uh, religious projects. So um, for the for the sake of simplicity in the map, we have, uh, we have only a, a section of, a selection of 13 sectors. But if you have a big enough computer, you could download the database and you'll see that we have like actually, a, I think it's around 150 di different subsectors in which uh, I think religious protection uh, is part of like the, uh, the governance and civil society projects. Um, and within those, you can actually, yeah, you'll see, you'll be able to find many projects. Um, I think that that's one uh, part of the, the answer. The other thing is that um, one thing we didn't mention about this is um, you know the intra-regional, uh, sorry, like the the um, development the development financing coming from the Middle East, and so the Middle East is actually quite a significant player in in Southeast Asia. Um, and when you look at which countries in the Middle East are, or which entities in the Middle East are providing the most financing, you'd be maybe not surprised to see that actually the Islamic Development Bank is the largest provider of development finance from uh, the Middle East in uh, the region, and it focuses a lot on Indonesia. Actually, 99% of its financing goes to Indonesia. Why? Because, you know, like there is this kind of religious, uh, there is, you know, like, I mean, Indonesia is a Muslim country, and there is this, um, how do you say, this connection that I think uh, Middle Eastern countries are trying to establish with uh, with uh, Southeast Asia, and so those kind of analysis are exactly the type of analysis we want you to do by uh, downloading the, the, the database, so please do. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Do we have another uh, question from the audience? Yes, this gentleman, just in the third, third or fourth row. 
Yes, hello. Um, I wonder whether we might... Uh, my name's Philip Elias and I'm wondering whether the, um, the people behind and working on this very, very impressive project might be able to make some comments on um, the question of uh, countries' decisions to spend aid and development money on the basis of ideology, which is largely in my international development experience through democracy building, governance, gender, issues like that, and hard or or other, other forms of investment, which might be just to encapsulate as infrastructure, let's say, mm. right, to put it in one word, and how you've observed the rationales for the decisions to invest in these directions. But the overlay and the part of the question which I think is most important is in, in terms of the Minister's remarks that we heard and the panel's reiteration of some of those remarks about partnerships, dialogue with recipients and beneficiaries, um, what, what do your research... Uh, experiences suggest about ideological or soft or uh, mercantile or hard forms of investment and how Australia might engage with its partners and what do they want from our from our aid support thank you well, thank you very very pointed question um, to give Alex a quick break Jenny would you do you have any interest in tackling that one yeah, that, that's, that's, a, that's a, thank you. <laughs> no, I mean, it's a really interesting question. So if you actually look at China's strategy, its Belt and Road strategy, it wants those, even though it made some mistakes and it gave loans where it was just after political influence to start with, it got pretty smart about wanting to be repaid. And in fact, analysis of many of the China loans that has been done has found that they're really, they're, they're in, infrastructure projects that make a rate of return, and that rate of return gets paid into an escrow account in China. So they are trying to tie that up. So they've got an economic kind of rationale for doing it. I actually think deeper than, uh, you know, the, just the, the reason that they're, they're slowing down on this is one, what are viable projects that they can invest in? But the other was they had accumulated a huge portfolio of US treasuries they were really exposed to the US Treasury market. The Belt and Road Initiative was one way of running down the US Treasury portfolio, creating a different set of assets, but also providing markets for their, their steel industry and their construction industry as that was slowing down in China. And they've been slowly winding down steel making in China and the like. And so, you know, it was a, it was a strategy that had many prongs to it, but it had a natural kind of winding down curve to it to some degree. So they're very focused on, you know, getting repaid is, and certainly mo much more so, as well as having that kind of wham influence, you know, good women cutting announceable type influence. I actually think the real power lies in, in that long term engagement of soft power. It's the, it's the smaller partner to partner. It's the engagement. It's the one and a half track. It's, um, I mean, one of the really interesting things in the in the data is if you actually looked at the Australia one and saw who were most of the sort of delivery partners, you had is huge numbers were think tanks, universities, and particularly into Southeast Asia, less so into into the Pacific, mm. but in Southeast Asia because it is trying to build those relationships. It's trying to build those kind of you know we respect your capabilities. And we can benefit from your capabilities as well as you can benefit from our capabilities. So it's trying to build that. It's a different approach. I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's how we keep at it. You don't want to pull out. And so one of the dangers of shrinking an aid program is you've been making this investment in relationships for years and then suddenly you stop it, you know, and it doesn't fall over all at once, but it will slowly kind of get less and less. Um, and so we need to make sure that if we reinvest in these relationships and reinvest in these uh, in these kind of engagements, we need to have a plan to keep going because it's you don't want to sort of stop and start. These are not things you can stop and start well. So I think that's what I think we're trying to do in, in that soft power. But it'd be really good to get Hillman's view on how he thinks what's more influential. Yeah, oh, I think like... Uh, the government is always dreaming, if I may speak for, as a former government officials, we always dreaming like have an integrated solutions. So not one piece by this country, the other piece by the other donors, the other piece by the donors. But how can you guys collaborate and come up to the country with the sophisticated solutions and come up with the sustainable potential support for the country? So that's that's the one that I view. Mm. Alex, do you want to come yes, as well? Yes, I'd like to say a little thing here. 
Um, just actually two things. Jenny mentioned, you know, like the delivery partners. This is something I didn't mention in my in my presentation. But you know, obviously, we're looking at like the development partners. But like most of the development partners don't actually have the technical capabilities to implement projects on the ground. So they are they're hiring contractors, what we call development um, implementing channels. And so we have actually uh, the information of all the implementing channels as well. So we have more than a thousand five hundred different implementing channels. The Lowe Institute is one of the implementing channels. I mean, the, this project is funded. Um, by uh, you know the aid program, and so we are you know trying to uh, improve transparency in South Asia in some ways. So that's one thing. The other uh, the other uh, thing for Philip, thank you for this is a great question. Um, I think Jenny answered this question very very well. Uh, one uh, data point I would relate to on the on the South East Asia aid map is that um, you know I mentioned to you that um, the United States is the largest provider of grants to South East Asia. Well, one of the largest subsectors in which the U.S. is spending its money is actually on uh, promotion of democracy. And you'll see, like, um, uh, the U.S. is trying to promote democracies in many countries. Um, so, you know, obviously trying to, to, to push for its ideology. Um, but then I remember I read an article saying that some countries actually don't welcome the promotion of democracies. So, you know, you could argue in a way that it's like a project that would, uh, that would push for um, the U.S.'s uh, values more than actually uh, benefit from like, the, recipient, the, the recipient countries. Yeah, I would just add a, add, a, add a comment on that. I mean, I think, um, you know, the interesting thing is how, the question is often how much thought necessarily goes into the choice between these different kinds of engagements. You know, there's geostrategic pressure to get into the infrastructure space, for example, you know, it's, it's leading to a desire to do more in infrastructure at the expense of other things, but not, not necessarily a careful thought process for why that might be the case. Um, it doesn't make sense to necessarily give up the soft infrastructure space, it's particularly not just, I mean, not just around democracy promotion, say, but around governance, around anti-corruption, around public sector reform, around all the, the, rate, the way infrastructure itself is regulated uh, and governed. Um, as a, in, in order to try and get into just financing infrastructure, going back to the original point Jenny made um, earlier. So I think the challenge is also making those sorts of decisions, and a lot of the time it's not really being guided by a clear strategy of the, of the trade-offs. We're all pretty much at the line. I think probably, we probably have time for one more question. Have we got one from the audience? This, this lady in the, in the middle here. Thank you so much. So interesting. I love the Pacific map. So really excited to see this expanded. Um, my question is around, I think the the quantitative data for this is so amazing and, you know, just offers up so much opportunity. But to your point around um, soft power and that kind of ongoing engagement and relationship and really transparency around where future dollars are spent, is there opportunity for this map to look at, um, I mean, at its simplest form, embedding some sort of program evaluation into the breakdown, um, but then also having a bit of an understanding of how future dollars are considered based on how past dollars have been invested? I'm just really curious around, you know, we've got a trajectory of spending. Um, how do we use this to demonstrate where future money and, and investment is going based on what partners are telling us on past spending? Thank you. It's a great, great question, Alex. Um, I'm not sure I actually one. understood the question. Sorry. Uh, the question, question was about the ability to integrate um, performance oh, yeah. sort of information into I the map. I got your question now. Um, yes. <laughs> Thank you. And, and to think about whether or not the trends and what it means for future yeah, uh, well, quality, so to speak. Yeah. Well, sorry, I'm French. So, like, you know, I don't understand everything that you say. It's uh, sometimes it's difficult for me, you know? Um, so, yeah, no, look, yeah, so I think this is a very good point. What, uh, this, what this tool is about is very much about the quantity of money flowing to the region. Um, at this point, we don't evaluate the quality of project. We don't, you know, it's difficult to, um, to um, yeah, it's difficult to know how efficient the project is on the ground. Saying this, though, uh, you'd be very pleased to know that at the Lowe Institute in the IPDC, we're working on what we call a donor efficiency index. So that's like, that, that's something that we are designing for the Pacific Aid Map first. But uh, we'll try to, uh, to uh, apply these basically macroeconomic views on how efficient the project is for the Pacific. And once we have the, once we, this method works for uh, the Pacific, then we'll be able to apply it for Southeast Asia. Is that, is that the kind of answer you were looking for? Yes. Okay. Yeah.
Uh, well, thank you very much uh, for that question. And let, let me thank uh, the audience for all of your great questions and being an excellent audience. And let me thank our panelists, uh, Dr. Jenny Gordon, Dr. Hilman Pallone, and of course, uh, Alex Dayant uh, for his excellent work on the Southeast Asia aid map. Round of applause, please, and thank you very much. <laughs>